and thank you all for the, you know, the real privilege of, of being here and being able to participate more as a listener than anybody active in terms of the dialogue that's going on. Um, I've come to learn in the four years that I've been involved in the Guantanamo litigation that um, judging evil is not easy. And I can also tell you that representing uh, a suspected terrorist is not simple or easy. The um, burning of the World Trade Center uh, still remains uh, deep in my mind, the horror, the anger. And when I was asked to take on the representation of a gentleman that you're going to hear about in a minute, his name is Noor Uthman Mohammed. Um, everyone calls him Noor. Um, I have to admit to you candidly that I had reservations. But um, we're a nation of laws, like Israel is a nation of laws. And the fact of the matter is that if we as lawyers don't take on the responsibility that we have to sometimes represent unpopular clients, we're not going to be much better than our enemies over time. And so it didn't take me or my partners very long to realize that this should be a matter, a cause, in the context of rule of law issues that I should get involved in. And so, as you have accurately stated, my interest, my passion, relates to making sure that whoever comes within the custody of my government gets prompt, fair justice and is treated with respect and integrity. And those are the issues that were put in dispute very early on in the Guantanamo litigation. And I've been there a few times. I've spent the collective amount of time of roughly three to four months, over four years. Been there probably 15, 16 times, just came back two weeks ago. You can't go to Guantanamo in any realistic way without going for a week. And I actually do have a client or two besides Noor that needs to be taken care of in addition to taking care of Noor from the standpoint of doing what I can. But it's been a wonderful, meaningful experience. And what I want to do is share with you parts of that experience as they inform the issues that relate to my paper. I need to tell you that um, over the years, I've always heard criticisms of the commission using as the metric Nuremberg or Tokyo or some other international courts. And so I said, you know, wouldn't it be interesting to really just learn a little bit about that? And so what I did is I went back in time to try to do a comparison of where we are today compared to what the procedures looked like in the context of Nuremberg. And I am not going to spend a lot of time on the detailed procedures of Nuremberg or Tokyo or the International Court in Rwanda or Yugoslavia. I'm going to spend most of my time comparing it to the military commission system here. Having met people here last year, having heard the discussion today, it is true that you and Israel have a lot to be proud of particularly when you compare it to some of the things that we've been involved in in the US. I'm not suggesting that your system is perfect. Okay, We have all a lot of work to do. In the United States, we have a lot of work to do. But I will suggest to you, this is coming from the mouth of a defense attorney, okay, that Guantanamo today, in terms of confinement, conditions, trial procedure, is a very different place than it was in 2002, in 2004, and as depicted in the photographs that tend to make it on the media. Again, I'm not trying to marginalize those things, but I do think that the success of our future requires that we step back and assess where we are today, where we can go in the future, and not just get bogged down in the past, because that's not going to get us anywhere. So what I want to do is first, real quickly, give you an overview. I don't know how many of you here have had the privilege 
of being at the Guantanamo prison camp. And um, so I'm going to just show you a little bit where it is, orient you to it. And then we're going to quickly go over the history that John has already done, but in a maybe different context. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my client, and then I want to do a comparison, if I can, on five areas that are the most important to me and troublesome to me as they relate to the military commission procedures. So without any further ado, and I'm, I have my clock here, so I'll, st I'll, I'll stay on time, I think. You took a little more than I thought, but we'll, we'll see if we can go. First of all, um, Guantanamo Bay, the, the military camp is on the bottom right-hand side. The United States has effectively possessed that area since the late 1800s. It was one of the rewards of the war, if you will, the Spanish-American War, used as a coaling station. Because in those days, obviously, we didn't have nuclear fuel. And when you go there, you'll actually see the old silos that were used as the ships were coming through to go there. Guantanamo Bay is a naval base. And it's now divided into a naval base, also a, uh, a prison camp, which I'll show you in a second. Okay, and also is what we call Camp Justice, which is where all the proceedings take place. This is just another shot focusing right in on the military camp. You actually fly in here on a, in a little airport that's managed by civilians, and you take a ferry. Jonathan's had the pleasure of taking that ferry, which runs not enough, not frequently enough. And then you go over to where the prison camp is. Now, Camp Justice, which is, I'll show you in a second, is here. The military base, naval base, they have a commissary, they have officers club, there's naval personnel there is up here. And the prison camps are down here. They're about six or seven miles from where we as lawyers, as judges, as prosecutors stay. There, are, um, there were six camps in operation. Over time, they've been closed. Now there are camp five, six, and seven. Um, Five is a, a maximum security. Six is a sort of a maximum minimum security. Seven is top secret. No one is supposed to know where that is, but if you know how to use Google, you can probably find it. Okay? This is just a satellite shot to give you another overview of Guantanamo. And here is Camp Justice. Some folks would argue that it's ironic that they call it Camp Justice. You'll make your own judgments, okay? Uh, this is where we get to live originally when I started in 2008. Very luxurious, exactly like the Intercontinental David that I'm staying in now in, in Tel Aviv. With all the comforts of home, I since have been upgraded. Like you talk about three stars, I now get to sleep in one of these. Okay? My wife loves it. I come home, you know, I, I make the bed, I do everything when I come home now. This is my little area where I get to sleep. I get to make my own bed, my sheets. I have to bring my own bar of soap. But other than that, it's comforts of home. And then we move out in the morning, we go, to the, we go to the prison camp. And this is a picture of an old area of the prison camp. Um, by the way, you are, as a detainee, you are sent to different camps depending upon how, quote, compliant you are, or whether you happen to be a high value detainee. The most um, uh, recognized high value detainees are the 9-11 folks, KSM that Jonathan mentioned earlier, and others, okay? Those people are brought out to their lawyers. I actually can go into a certain area of the camp to meet my client in a, a room that's about eight by eight. It's a, little, it's a little bit, I get a little bit more privileges than they do. These are old pictures. This is not what Guantanamo looks like today, okay? You, the uniforms also determine how compliant, so the color helps the guards understand whether they're dealing with a compliant person, non-compliant person, or the like. This is a typical cell in, a, uh, in camps five, six, and I assume seven, um, because I've never been to seven. And let me just stop for a second. Everything I'm going to talk about today is public information. None of it is classified information. Anything I talk about today is information you can find yourself for yourself on the internet. And I just want whoever's listening to understand that's how I'm going to be proceeding today. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Noor, OK? Noor is a uh, Sudanese man who grew up in poverty outside of Port Sudan. 
Uh, Noor had very little education. Uh, he speaks Arabic. He um, was an orphan very early on, slept on the street, in homes, what have you. Uh, ultimately had a calling, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the key point here is that uh, Noor himself never took arms against a civilian, never took arms against the United States military, disavowed ever being a member of Al-Qaeda, disavowed ever being a member of the Taliban, okay? And what acts that he is associated with predate 9-11 by almost a year, predate the United States so-called declaration of war with the military authorized act that took place in September of 9-11, of, of, uh, okay? Noor um, was on his way. He came from Port Sudan, went up ultimately after a two-year you know, journey, found his way in coast, which I'm not going to bore you with. The, his story is the story of a lot of these people that were coming up, learning how to use basic arms, and going back to their respective communities where they were dealing with people that, in Sudan's case, there was oppression, doubt for, issues uh, you heard about the Uyghurs in western China, okay? They were going back, Chechnya, and dealing with issues there. Thousands of people went through Calden, which is where Noor went and stayed. Others went on, and Calden was ultimately closed down because of a dispute between who was running Calden and the heads of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, including, including bin Laden, who wanted Calden to become a training camp for Al-Qaeda. They closed it down, and Noor left in 1999, wound up in Pakistan on his way back to Sudan, and was the subject of a raid that took place in March of 2002, which is somewhat celebrated because there were 12 or so simultaneous raids of guest houses. They were after a man by the name of Abu Zubaydah, that Jonathan, I'm sure, knows that as well. They got Abu Zubaydah and they got everybody else, and among the people they got was Noor. Noor stayed in the custody of Pakistani police, was transferred to Bagram. The red line demonstrates how long Noor has been in Guantanamo. He's going on his 10th year, okay? The acts that he really, really has been charged with would be material support of terrorism in, in common language here. He did train some people for a while about how to use uh, rifles, handguns, things of that nature. Never received any training himself on planning, executing operations, doesn't know how to fly a plane, doesn't know any other language but Arabic. Um, ultimately, he didn't enjoy doing what he's doing, and he started running errands like a local uh, errand person, you know, getting supplies and things of that nature. But nevertheless, he was picked up and brought down. In the course of the proceedings that we had for Noor, we actually did a profile between Noor and what an operational terrorist would be, as that term is defined today. Noor, again, not well educated, not multilingual, no training in advanced explosive or tactics no knowledge of technical information, military-wise, and the like. Hardly someone that would be employed to deal with the kind of acts that Noor was charged with. He was charged in supporting 9-11, the embassy bombings, the failed bombing of LA airport, and the like. So that's a little bit about Noor, okay, and where he was from 2002 until um, where he is today. Jonathan touched a little bit about the history. In my world, the real battle that took place starting in 2002 and forward was over the president's war power. Was it absolute? Meaning, could it in any way be tempered by individual rights that we have contained in our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, particularly, you know, the Fifth Amendment and the like? And and that battle went on. Uh, you know, we had a battle of whether the president could go ahead and do things, whether the president needed the permission of Congress, but ultimately is what role does the court have under a separation of powers issue? And I will tell you this, there was also this issue that was roaming around until Hamdan, okay? The notion 
that somehow every human being in this world isn't entitled to be treated in a way that would not constitute cruel treatment and torture. The notion that from 2002 until 2006 when Hamdan was decided that somehow the United States of America was not subject to Article 3 of the, of the Geneva Convention in all of the conventions, it was, it was just very unsettling for folks like me and others. This is just a timeline of the litigation. A, 9-11, people like Jonathan and others started getting involved in doing the heavy lifting from 2000 and, and really two up until the first major Supreme Court decision, second, third, and fourth. And we'll go over them real quick. Hamdi versus Rumsfeld. That's the one that dealt with the nonsense that somehow every U.S. citizen isn't entitled to the protections of the U.S. Constitution. Okay? Razul, which was an opinion written by Sandra Day O'Connor from our state, dealt with the notion that what do you mean Guantanamo is not for all intents and purposes an American territory? You guys have been there since the late 1800s. You've been cutting rental checks since 1875. You control that, and if there's somebody down there, they're going to be entitled to certain basic due process rights. The details of those are going to be worked out over time. Hamdan, critical for lots of different reasons. For me, the most important thing was a recognition that common Article 3 of the Geneva Convention applies across the board. And then, of course, we have Bumidian, which Jonathan talked about earlier. That's the one that you heard most about. That's the one that established habeas corpus rights for Guantanamo detainees. So let's move to Noor's proceedings, OK? Uh, this is a sketch, actually, of Noor. I would not allow photographs taken of Noor, even though cameras were allowed in the courtroom. There are privacy reasons, and there's a greater sensitivity. One of the beauties of getting involved in something that you never thought you would. I mean, I do securities work, guys. I do patent infringement work. I deal with bits and bytes and electronic circuitry. I don't deal with different cultures. I don't deal with different traditions. I don't deal with different languages. This was an educational process for someone like me. Think about this for one second, OK? Here is an American citizen being asked to represent a Sudanese detainee who's been there for six and a half years before he met me, OK? He speaks Arabic. I speak English. He's Muslim. I'm Jewish. I have a passion for Israel. I don't think he does. <laughs> My co-counsel, who is a JAG officer, is a woman. We're going to build a relationship? We're going to build a relationship? Mind-boggling, but rewarding. The minute he called me up to that council table after some discussions and allowed me to stand behind him and said, Your Honor, I represent Noor Uthman Mohammed, and from now on, you're going to take instructions from me. Big time in my career. OK? So let's now go to the comparison, OK? And like. Like Nuremberg and um, like the Rwanda, Yugoslav uh, in, uh, uh, courts, in practice, these are really public trials. And it needs to be. Without transparency, we're lost. Because people just keep wondering what's going on behind the doors. Now, keep in mind, I'm a big proponent of national security and the need to make sure that while we uphold individual rights, we don't sacrifice national security. So please don't get me wrong. You're not going to see me on any real liberal page, and you're not going to see me on any real hawk page. I'm sort of right down the middle. And public trials are important. And in the commission, they have a special courtroom built. It's a modular courtroom, yada, yada, yada. Lawyers, benches, you know, we've got so many room for so many lawyers. The press sits behind a glass sound, you know, soundproof area. And there's a TV monitor that shuts down the camera if you need to. Because there are need, there is a need, to disclose to close certain information to the public. There's classified information. And sometimes we miss it. And that's why there's a security analyst that's sitting in the back of the courtroom and says to the judge with a red button, better take another look. Everything shuts down. We take another look and we move forward. But let me tell you, in response to the question today, we worked till 11, 12 o'clock at night to make sure that we could use as much information publicly as we could so the press wouldn't be barred from having it. And they were Twittering real time what was going on in my trial. Okay? That's progress. That's progress. In the 9-11 arraignments that we had, you'll, you'll remember, 
That was the first time the arraignment was videotaped to six different places in the United States so victims of families and others could observe. That's progress. Speedy trial, boy, do we bomb on that. And my client is a classic case. Comes in August of 2008, not charged for six years? Then those charges are dismissed? Then he's recharged right before Obama gets, uh, gets sworn in? And the first time he's arraigned is 2009, seven years later, and the first time he sees any evidence is his trial in February of 2011. One of the media reporters from, from, uh, from France who was down here asked me, was I really happy? I wasn't happy. How can anybody be happy with a, with a nine or ten year delay? Okay? We need to do a better job here. I'm not saying there weren't supposed reasons, but we need to move forward, and you guys are models in that regard to some extent. And then we had these other delays. Okay? And we got to the point where we realized that the government wanted us to ask for an extension on discovery reasons because they didn't really have any interest in moving our case ahead. So we move ahead and we go to the next subject, compulsory process. We had it. Limited. Limited. Not the way I want it, but we had it. We could, we could subpoena things. We could subpoena witnesses within limitations. Um, we had the requirement of the prosecution to actually provide exculpatory information. This is unheard. This wasn't Nuremberg. This is 2011, the United States of America. Okay? And yes, classified information was restricted. Most of the time for good reasons. Sometimes I didn't agree, but at least we had more than we had five years ago. That's progress. That's progress. And we had the beauty. This is one of the reasons you do this work. There was no precedent in Guantanamo for handling classified information with a protocol. We established it based upon the Iran Contra decision that came down. The judge adopted our protocol. The government lists for us what they claim is classified. We get to respond to the list as to why it isn't, and we get to be heard ex parte. So we don't disclose to the government why it is we think this information may be useful. That's, that's progress. That's progress. And of course, Brady material is not covered. And for those of you who are lawyers, it means more from the United States. But this is more exculpatory impeachment information. The proceedings itself, we pushed and pushed and pushed for what we call an Article 5 hearing. That's the jurisdictional hearing. Can you believe this man has been down there since August of 2002 and never had a hearing on whether or not the commission had jurisdiction over his person? Well, they didn't want to go to that hearing because the witnesses they claimed against my client were the two of the several water board witnesses that you read about in the paper, and they had to turn over information to us. So ultimately, we negotiated a deal. The deal was he was charged originally with material support of terrorism and conspiracy, murder, killing people, 9-11 and the like. All that was wiped out, and he was recharged material support Okay, and conspiracy to material support, basically aiding and abetting. Both of those nevertheless carried life sentences, and our deal was 34 months from the day of the deal, he goes back to Sudan. He took it for good reason. But in the military, you'll still need to have a jury trial, and the military commission system adopts the military code of justice jury trial for sentencing. In the civilian courts, the judge sentences. In the military system, there's a jury trial, and we had a jury trial for Noor that followed the plea. Now, next comparison, impartial judge. Here's the, one of the biggest problems. Under the Military Commission Act, everything happens from the convening authority, including assignment of counsel, assignment of judges, assignment of jury panel members, any requests for expert and the like. There's inherent conflicts there. There's inherent conflicts there. Um, we're much better than it was in Nuremberg, but not quite as, as good as it was uh, in terms of Yugoslav and, and Rwanda. This is my pet peeve, and I mentioned that at lunchtime. We still allow the admission of testimonial hearsay, and not just one level, double hearsay, triple hearsay, doesn't matter how many levels. The two witnesses that were read in against my client Neither of them ever met my client, okay? And one of them recanted. And both of them were in the custody of the U.S. I had no way to meaningfully cross-examine that kind of information. So 
That, to me, is an area where we have to fix. Hearsay isn't the answer. There's a Sixth Amendment right to confrontation, and that's what I think ought to be applied. But that's for another day and another academic discussion. Privilege against self-incrimination, you know, pretty good. OK, and the like. Confessions now, we have whoever offers the confession has to prove up its reliability and that the burden of proof stays with there. This is the plea agreement, 34-month cap. These are some of the sentencing themes. I'm not going to take time with them now. We had a full jury trial, voir dire opening statements. The judge that I had, military judge captain, who'd been in the service a long time, she never had a full trial because usually you plea and you plea and you go into your sentence. She let us do an entire trial on sentencing down there, including trial briefs. She said, I don't know what a trial brief is. She says, I think I like it. We're going to do it from now on. You have the ability to have input, OK? You don't get everything you want, but you can make some progress. These are some of the things. post bomidian consistent with what Jonathan said, it's like the wheels stopped. The election's going on. Nothing's going to happen down there, OK? And then we moved the impact of Obama. You know, everybody was all charged up about Mr. Obama coming on board, changing everything. Well, the reality is we are basically where we were before, plus a little more aggressive. Okay? There won't be any changes in my prediction until we get the election over. What's next? 171 detainees are still down there out of some 750. Of the 171, 32 referred for prosecution. 46 is the indefinite detention. Some of those 46 will never, ever be charged because the evidence collection was bungled so badly that if the government tried to do something, they wouldn't have any proof to put it on. And the question is, what do you do? You release them or do you keep them using this notion of administrative detention? 57 Yemenis have been approved for release, but the situation over there is such that they're not going to release them. And we have four people that are convicted under plea bargains. My client's one. He's got 22 months left. And we have the restarting. This is my trial team. These are the shoulders I stood on, folks. Look at the youth here. Committed people. Committed people. Intelligent analysts, four JAG lawyers, investigators, torture survivor experts, all for the defense, all paid for, I say this to US audiences, by your taxpayer dollars. Okay? The only one who didn't get paid a penny was the guy you're looking at. And that's my privilege. That's my privilege. That's the gift that I get from being a lawyer. Okay? Last, and this is, I'm going to close. We can work together and get this done. The we is the government and the defense. The we is the prosecutors and the defense. How do I know? Because I had a personal live experience. Not everybody's going to be the same way, but we argued over what we had to argue about, OK? And we didn't get caught up in the noise. And when I got off the plane, the chief military prosecutor came up to me and said, Mr. Cabot, it's been a pleasure to deal with you and your team. We're giving you a medallion to make you an honorary member of the military commission unit. This meant a lot to me. You talk about how you feel when it's your adversaries that come up to you. That's the test, in my mind. And so we can keep working together if we talk and communicate with each other, and we talk and, and vigorously talk about issues that, we, that are need to be talked about. But let's not get caught up in the noise and the bickering about discovery and this and that and name calling. It doesn't get you anywhere. That's it. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Martin Luther King, I believe it. That's why I've done the work I've done. And we're done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>